First, before I dive in, a bit about me. So I'm a PhD student, so I'll largely talk about my PhD, but don't worry, only the fun parts, not the boring parts. So I come from uh, Belgium, Brussels, and I work at the Software Languages Lab. So that's a lab where we try to solve different kinds of problems in programming, either by making a new language, tools, or middleware. So I'm funded by the Flemish government, I have to say this. And my research is also part of a bigger project where we try to see how we can incorporate my research with uh, Belgian companies. So that's the TLS project, also funded by the Flemish government. So let us start from the beginning. Web programming in the 90s, so we saw the first web pages, like this really static HTML, uh, in what we call the HTML age. So the clients were actually just the user interface, HTML pages with no logic in there. So all the logic was on the server side, if you even had logic uh, for your website. And you had like a lot of HTML pages and you could browse through them by just following the links. Also, people really like to use horrible color schemes and animations back then. So we moved on, we did better, and we went into the LAMP age. So LAMP age stands as an acronym for the technology stack that was often used then, LAMP, um, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP or Perl. Uh, so it's around 2000, and we see we have now more dynamic web applications. So AJAX was introduced in 2004, I believe, or 2006. And thanks to AJAX, we could make asynchronous calls to the server side and load content dynamically. So our pages are becoming less static, and we also need to have less pages overall. Um, we now, thanks to JavaScript, we can now also uh, we try to program more logic on the client side as well. So typical examples are like the first web shops, personal blog page, and so on. But now actually we're in the JavaScript age. So we have these one page apps where content is added, removed, updated dynamically. Uh, so they're not static at all. And we now also program a lot of the program logic on uh, the, uh, the client side as well. So you have like Google Docs, these really collaborative web applications. So these applications I'm talking about, we call them rich internet applications. So you have a really rich, thick client that contains part of a program logic, so in JavaScript. You have these one page apps where every content is updated reactively. And then you also have this offline availability of your data on the client side, so thanks to HTML5 and offline storage, you can now store part of your data offline as well. And thanks to that you also have this part of your program logic on the client side, actually parts of your application even work when you're uh, offline, you have no connection. And most of the time, these rich internet applications also combine lots of other services from other servers in a mashup kind of way, like integrating a Twitter feed and so on. So how do you implement such a rich internet application? So you have to choose a technology for your three different tiers. So your database tier, server tier, and client tier. So for your database, you can choose a relational database. For your server side, you pick a language that seems fit for the job, Java, PHP, language, uh, language you like, so no judgment there. And on the client side, of course, you're stuck with JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and then you can add lots of JavaScript libraries on top of there to get this really reactive, rich internet applications. Of course, if you don't rely on a web framework and you choose your own technology for every tier, you have to write a lot of glue code to make all these technologies work together. Actually, you can take another approach. So thanks to Node.js, we can now write JavaScript on the server side as well. So your technology stack then becomes like, you choose a JSON-based database on your uh, database tier. Node.js on your server side, it may be a uh, server side framework on top of it. And then on your client side, also it is JavaScript. And so this idea of having the same language on your different tiers is what we call tierless programming. So it's often called single tier, multi tier, or isomorphic programming as well. It's just all the same. It means that you have a single language and you actually uh, develop your web application in the single language. So you're three different tiers. And actually, it seems now more like you're writing a desktop application instead of a distributed web application. And we see that you have three different approaches to this tierless program. You have the tierless frameworks, rewriting tools, and languages. So I will now discuss these three approaches. So tierless frameworks, uh, two famous ones, Google Web Toolkit and Meteor, they allow you to write your web application in one single language. So Java for Google Web Toolkit, JavaScript for Meteor. And the frameworks themselves provide a lot of libraries or packages 
to, for example, talk to a database, communication to do communication between client and server, making your user interface, and so on. So let us take a look at the Hello World example for web applications, so a chat. This is a chat for the Meteor uh, framework. So this is JavaScript, and this is one single file, and that's all that it takes. So this is your chat application. So it's one file, and you have to check at runtime whether this file is being executed on the server side or on the client side. So we have these two if checks on line 3 and 12 to see uh, where it is running. If it's running on the client side, then I install an event listener that will be called when I click the send button, and there I make a message and I insert it into a collection. On the server side, I simply say, okay, you cannot uh, put empty messages in this collection. And that's all it takes. And all the magic actually happens in this Meteor collection package. So on line one, I make this collection called messages. And this is actually um, the, where we um, communicate with the client and, and uh, the server and we broadcast to other clients. So we simply insert new messages in there. Uh, so on the client side, the collection package will make sure that the collection on the client side will send this to the collection that also lives on the server side and then the server will broadcast it to every client. Now, the nice thing about this collection that is they also automatically get persisted, so on the server side to a MongoDB database, and on the client side, Meteor has uh, what they call a mini Mongo database um, that persists, persists to uh, offline storage, so thanks to HTML5 as well. And that's all it takes, so you have this collection package, you use it, it handles your database and your communication between client and server. So that's the uh, JavaScript part. You also have your HTML part, of course, of your application. So this is the HTML, and I use an uh, HTML templating system. And the nice thing is that in here, you can refer to your variables from your JavaScript file. So on line four, I loop over my messages collection, and I simply display every message. And that's all it takes. So this HTML will be updated reactively every time a new message is inserted. So really, you can just take this code run it in Meteor, and that's your web application. So you don't have a lot of glue code. Everything is handled by the framework for you. So TLS frameworks, they allow you to program in a mainstream language, so Java or JavaScript. They have this extensive set of libraries to handle like all kinds of concerns. And it's easy to reuse JavaScript libraries, so in Meteor, because it's in JavaScript itself. In uh, Google Web Toolkit, it's in Java, but they allow you to integrate JavaScript snippets in your Java code. Now onto the TLS rewriting tools. So the idea here is that you have, you also program in a mainstream language and you give some developer hints to the TLS rewriting tool. So it seems like you're just making an, a local program, then you add these developer hints, can be annotations, and then the tool will rewrite your local synchronous program into a distributed one. So examples, for example, is G Orchestra that takes Java bytecode of a local program, you provide a distribution plan, it's an XML file where you say, this class must be on the server, this class must be on the client, and so you do this for every class. And then they will actually do this rewriting and make a distributed web application for you. No, actually it's not a web application, it's just distributed applications in general, so they don't focus on uh, web applications. Now Volta is a tool that does this, so it's from Microsoft Research, and they take C-sharp code, where you annotate in the code where classes should be, and then they rewrite your file that seems like a local file um, into a distributed web application. And then Ripley is another tool built on top of Volta, also by Microsoft Research, and they focus on safety, so they add this safety layer on top of Volta, and they replicate, uh, they do replicated execution, so meaning that if a client does an action, they will replay this, uh, on the server side as well, and then compare the results. So I wanted to give a chat application example for these rewriting tools as well, but G Orchestra is not for web application, and Volta is actually a dead project, so there's like one paper about it, that's it, no documentation, so I couldn't play around with it, so I just took the example from the one paper that is out there. So this is a, a distributed Fibonacci. So I have two snippets, a server snippet and a client snippet, and um, in the first, I, I make a class main that has a method Fibonacci, which is just the recursive definition of Fibonacci. Uh, and then I say on line one, this um, main class must run at the server. Then in my second snippet, the client snippet, I want to call this Fibonacci method, so I have to provide like an external interface for it. So I say that it's an external method, 
And it's going to be an asynchronous method because of course I'm doing communication between client and server in a non-blocking asynchronous way. So my interface on the client side now has an extra parameter, namely a continuation. So that's a callback function that will be called when I retrieve the result from the server side. And then I call the function uh, on the client side and I provide this continuation saying that when I retrieve the result, I will simply display it. So that's all it takes. And the rewriting tools of Volta will make this application distributed. So the Fibonacci method from the server side will become a remote asynchronous method. So you don't have to write it yourself. The tool will do this for you. So TLS rewriting tools, they also allow you to program in a mainstream language. You have to provide these developer hints or developer annotation. And then based on this, they make an actual distributed application out of it. But it's harder to integrate JavaScript libraries in there. So the one uh, G Orchestra doesn't focus on web applications, so no JavaScript there. And in Volta, uh, it's not clear. I think it's just not possible to do this. Uh, so you can't integrate like libraries like React to have this really rich internet application. So onto the TLS languages. So they make a totally new language, and most of them are actually from academia. So we like to make new languages. So uh, here they are. So um, they provide a totally new syntax. Uh, and what's actually funny, most of them try to have like a JavaScript-like syntax. So the links paper actually says it's not because we like JavaScript, it's just because programmers, web programmers seemed familiar with it, so we took like parts of it and integrated in our new syntax. Um, then in these languages, you have some kind of way of saying that this must be at the server side, this must be at the client side, this is communication between them. For example, in the hop language, you have this tilde and dollar sign, and I think the tilde is for saying this expression should be on the server side, and with dollar, you switch to the client side. And um, first, um, so you have these tierless languages now. You don't have your server and client anymore. So most of the time, you structure your program via the uh, model view controller pattern. So this is uh, what OPA, this example here, does. So OPA is a typed language. So for my chat messages, I first have to make a type message which just contains a string for my message. Then I make my model. And I can broadcast to all the clients. Then in my model on line eight, I make an exposed function. So a function that will be called by the client side that lives on the server side. And it will simply broadcast the message on the network I just declared. And then I also have a function to register a callback so that the client can register a callback that will be called when a new message is uh, retrieved from the server side. Now the controller is not that interesting uh, here, just like two lines, so this is the view part. And as you can see, we have a function chat HTML, which has like HTML-like syntax in there. So that's the nice thing about these new languages, because they're making a new syntax, they can do stuff like this. So I just create an HTML snippet in this function that will be returned and displayed. And in there, I say, on line four, um, when the HTML has been loaded, um, I want to register a callback that will be called when I retrieve a message from the uh, server. So that's a user update function on line 15. If you look at this function, it's just a normal function which takes a message and will update the HTML. Then in the chat HTML function, of course, I want to, I want to say when I click the button, then I want to contact the server to say, here is a new message broadcasted to all the other clients. So that's on line seven. Uh, I have this function there, my event listener for the button, and I say, I call the broadcast function, which is defined on line 11. And then there, I call the actual broadcast function from before that lives on the server side. So the broadcast from my uh, model. So that's it, actually. Uh, that's your chat application in um, OPA. So TLS languages, they provide a totally new language, so you can't program in a mainstream language. Each of these languages try to solve a particular concern of web applications, and because they provide this new syntax, you have this uh, integrated and user interface and database uh, templating that you can integrate in a nice way in your uh, application. Now, we have now seen these three different approaches. We can now compare them to some criteria. So the first is, do they have tool support? Can you reuse your favorite IDE, uh, quality tool, unit testing framework, and so on? Second, do they allow you to program in a mainstream language or do you have to learn their new syntax? Thirdly, 
can you integrate JavaScript libraries in there? So can you go full-fledged uh, on the client side with all these JavaScript libraries out there? Fourthly, do they allow you to focus on these non-functional concerns such as offline availability of your application, latency, security, and so on? And then the last, do they have this integrated user interface and database templating uh, syntax? So TLS frameworks, they perform really well on the first three criteria because they allow you to program in a mainstream language so you can reuse your favorite IDE and so on. You can integrate JavaScript libraries in there as well, but they do not allow you to focus on non-functional concerns. So if you want to do this, you will have to know how the framework works. You will have to write an extension yourself and so on. So it's not easy to do this. Um, then the tierless tools, so there'll be writing tools. They also allow you to program in a mainstream language, but you have these annotations in there. So you can't reuse your favorite tools because of course they are not aware of these annotations. Uh, and it's also harder to integrate JavaScript in there. Um, none of these tools we have looked at allow you to focus on non-functional concerns as well, so they don't perform really well on that criteria. And um, some of them have an integrated user interface templating system, but uh, not as the languages. So the languages actually perform only pretty well on the last requirement because they have this new syntax to express your user interface, make queries to your database, and so on. So if you look at this, we decided we can do better. And so this is where my, my research comes in. So my research is about a tier splitting approach in a mainstream language. So what is this tier splitting approach? So the idea is that you start from tierless JavaScript code where you have some annotations in there. So why JavaScript? Because the reason I said before, all web developers are familiar with it. Then we perform a code analysis on it that will help us to do the actual tier splitting. So we have our um, tierless JavaScript code that seems like a local file then we want to split the server side part from the client side part, um, and then make an actual distributed application of it. So the tier splitting will split these two parts, and then the refactoring will just rewrite the, call, uh, the code into a real distributed application. So this tierless JavaScript code, how does this look like? So you can imagine you have one single file with blocks of code, and these blocks of code, you annotate them to be uh, either they are on the client side or at the server side. So an example here, I have two blocks of code, so on line two and 10. And the first one I say, this must be at the server, and the second one must be at the client. In the server side, I make a function, so it's just a local, normal JavaScript function, broadcast, takes a message, and we'll call another function with that message. Now on the client side, I first define a client ID, then I make a local definition, the display message function that will use jQuery to update my HTML with the new message I received, and then it calls the broadcast function with my client ID and says hello, so an initial message. Now, the good thing about this is, you see, you don't have to write remote procedures, stuff like that, it's just local functions and local function calls. Two advantages of this approach, of taking this TLS JavaScript approach, you can reuse all JavaScript libraries that are out there to do, um, to take, um, yeah, so for G, you can use jQuery, so as I've shown here, you can uh, use graph libraries to draw nice graphs and so on. Secondly, these annotations, as you can see, they are made inside comments. So other tools ignore them. You can reuse your favorite tools, but we, of course, we use them to you, uh, for this tier splitting process. Now, it's of course, it's JavaScript with annotations. So we have roughly four uh, uh, categories of annotations. So the first one, you already saw for placement. So you can say, this would be at the server side, at the client side, we also have a shared annotation, so to say, I don't care where this will be, it just must be on the tier where it is used. And we also have a user interface annotation, so we also support HTML templating in there. Then we have communication annotations, data sharing annotations, and failure handling annotations. But I will show you this with examples. So in here I have a, a little program, and on the server side I will have a collection of user scores for a, a game, for example. So I define this collection on line four, it's just a JavaScript array, and then I have a function at score that takes a user and a score, makes a new object out of it, and pushes this into the collection. Then on my client side, so uh, the block starts on line 13, uh, I create a user ID, I add an initial score to, uh, on the server side to the collection, so by just calling the add score function with my user ID and the default value zero, and then I want to loop over the score collection and display uh, all the other users their, their score. 
Now, two things to note here. So I have this score collection that will live on the server side, but I annotated this to be at observable. So that means it will be replicated to every client and every client will receive updates, but they cannot change it themselves. Otherwise, you can change the scores of other users or yourself. So you, want to have, you don't want to have that behavior, but you want the client to be able to have that collection because on line 17, we want to display it. So you just define it on the server side, you say at observable, and our tool will make sure that this collection is available on every client side. Then I have the add score function, and that's actually a function that will be called by the client side. So I say with an annotation on top of it, this is actually a remote function. Then when I call it from the client side on line 16, I have to say this is a remote call. Of course, you don't want to do this for every function, and I will show you how we can solve this. But first, another example. So here I have a function on the server side on line four. Share on Twitter, so I want to share an article on Twitter. So this is, of course, a simplified example. Um, you will call the Twitter API there and so on, but I didn't uh, include this here. But then the function wants to say, okay, I shared it on Twitter. I want to display uh, something on the client side saying it is shared on Twitter. Of course, I don't want to do this on every client. I, also, I only want to do this on the client that called this function. So that's why I have this add reply on top of the call to display popover on line seven. So that means I will only call this function on the client that called this function and I will not broadcast it to every client. Uh, and then, of course, the display popover function is a remote function on the client side. Now, another thing to note here, so this is uh, like normal JavaScript local function calls, but we are going to make a distributed application out of it. Of course, a lot of things can go wrong in a distributed setting. There will be errors that are not, that won't happen in this local uh, program. So that's why we have the use handler uh, annotation. So on line one, we say, on the server side, when something goes wrong, by sending messages to the client, first I want you to retry two times. If that fails, I want you to start buffering calls for that client so when he reconnects, uh, all the calls will be flushed to the client. And then I also want uh, to log every error. So this is default. Uh, so we, I provide these failure handlers for you, but you can write your own failure handlers as well. But these are, uh, we looked at that, we researched this. We have other ones, we came up with a set that we think is convenient for most programmers. So back to these annotations, so we have JavaScript with all these annotations, so we saw the placement annotations, and you put these on a block level, so you say, this block must be there or there. Then communication annotations, you put them on top of a function or a call to a function. Data sharing annotations, you put them on top of a declaration. Uh, so you say, this declaration of this variable must be observable, or I want it to be just copied, I want it to remain local on this tier, and so on. And then the failure handling annotations, you put them on top of a block, so you say everything on the server side, use these handlers, or you can also put them on individual calls. <clears throat> now, of course, I already said it, uh, you don't want to put all this at remote call, at remote function on every function and call. So that's where we use uh, program analysis. So for our program analysis, we look at every statement in the program and we see whether there happens to be a call in there or a data reference. And then the program analysis will tell us it's a call to a server-side function or a client-side function, or it's a, call, uh, it's a data reference to something that was declared on the server-side or on the client-side. So for those of you interested, we use um, static analysis that uses abstract interpretation. But that doesn't matter, it works. So before we had, um, without the analysis, we had to really explicitly say, this is a remote function, this is a remote call. With the analysis, you don't have to do that. So now you can simply omit those um, annotations. And we do this actually for every statement, and then we can come up with something which we call a program dependency graph. So it's like an abstract syntax tree, but with extra information. So for every statement, um, we remember it's a server, um, side statement or a client side statement, or it's shared, so I don't care about this. Then we also make call and data dependencies between these uh, nodes, and then we also remember it's a remote call or a remote data reference or a local call or a local reference. And then we perform the actual tier splitting on this. So um, we want to have all the nodes in the program that are needed to execute the server side and all the nodes that are needed to execute the client side. And for that, we use a technique that is called program slicing. It's very old, it was introduced in 1981, so it's even older than me. 
but it has been proven useful uh, in debugging, testing, and so on. So we extended this program slicing with notions of a tier, so client-side, server-side. We also um, made it incorporate remote call and remote data dependencies. So the tier splitting now, we end up with two sets of nodes that should be on the server-side and on the client-side. Of course, now we have to make our distributed program, so that's where we do the code transformation. <clears throat> So we take these two sets of nodes and we make notes and we make a program out of it. And where before on the server side we had a local broadcast function and now we now make a remote function out of it. So for this we use an RPC library that we wrote ourselves, but you can uh, rewrite it to any uh, framework you like. So now we make a remote uh, function out of it, so on line four. And you see it has an extra parameter, so a callback function. So we make synchronous function functions asynchronous for you. So this callback hell that you have with Node.js, we write it for you. You don't have to write it yourself. When we make a call, uh, so on line five, to the display message function, now this is a remote call, so an RPC to uh, a client-side function. And then, of course, on the client-side code, my display message function now becomes a remote function, so the server can call it. And on line 19, when I call the broadcast function, it has to be a remote call as well. So this is a code we generate for you. Now, how well do we perform now with um, this tier splitting approach for JavaScript? So you have this tool support. You can reuse your favorite tools because its annotations are made inside um, comments. It's a mainstream language. It's JavaScript. So you can even reuse every JavaScript library that is out there and incorporate it into your tearless JavaScript code. Now, for non-functional concerns, I haven't talked about this, and so we perform not that good but we will solve this. Um, and we have this integrated user interface templating. We have this at user interface annotation. But at the moment, we are kind of ignoring the database layer, but that's, of course, future work. Now, we want to do better on the fourth requirement. So you want to easily express non-functional concerns like offline availability of your application, latency, security, and so on. So that's where we introduce web slices. So web slices are units of code which you annotate with a name. So for example, in my web application, I can have a data slice, which contains all my declarations. I can have a display slice, which will contain um, every uh, function that will display this data and so on. And so you have these small units of code slices, and you want to experiment with them. You, you would uh, like to say, if I put this slice on the client side, how does this affect my application? So you have to provide a web slice configuration. So now we have an add slice annotation. You give a name it in the code. And then you had an f add config uh, annotation. So there you map these names of these slices to their actual tier. So you say the data slice must be on the server, for example. Now the story is the same as before, of course. In between these slices, you can have local calls, your functions stay, local function definitions, and so on. So this is an example of a chat message. So I omitted the bodies of the function just to make it smaller. So I have four slices. Um, the first one defines a collection of users, two functions to add a user to this collection and generate a new ID for a new client. Then my messages slice contains a collection of messages and I can add messages to this. Then I have a listener slice that will install uh, event listeners on the buttons of my HTML. And then I have a display slice that just will has a function to display all these messages. And then I have to provide a configuration saying, the user's uh, slice must be on the server and so on. And then the story is the same as before. You have this placement of these slices, then we can perform the tier splitting and the code transformation for you. Now, of course, if you have a big project with a lot of slices, maybe there are slices that you don't really care about. So that's where placement strategies um, come in. So if you have slices that you don't care about, you just don't give them a placement. And then you choose a placement strategy. So you can have a placement strategy that focuses on offline availability, that will try to place these slices you don't care about in such a way that you maximize your offline availability of your application. You can have a uh, placement strategy that tries to minimize the latency of your application or maximize the security. Or you can write one yourself that is, is a combination of other concerns, of course. And then you have like this new developer, developer process, actually. So you give an initial configuration you choose a placement strategy. And then the tool will try to place all these slices in the correct uh, tier. And it reports back to you, with this configuration, you have like 80% offline availability. If you're happy with it, 
you uh, transform the code into the uh, distributed application. If you're not happy with it, you have like this dashboard experience where you can experiment and say, maybe I want uh, less latency, more offline availability. Please try to reconfigure this, and then the tool will report back to you. So with these small movable web slices, we can now actually express every non-functional concern. So uh, in my PhD, I'm on, focusing on offline availability of your data, but of course you can rewrite, uh, you can write um, displacement strategies yourself and focus on any concern you like. So we've implemented this, but of course it's research in progress. It's only me that's working on this, so you can try it out, but yeah, there could be bugs in there. Um, so um, you have you input your TLS JavaScript code with these annotations on the left side. Then you can try, uh, ask the tool to transform it for you. You get this offline report back that says like 75% of your uh, slices are now on the client side. 25% I put on the uh, server side. Then this uh, is put on the client side. You have like 33% outgoing calls to the server and so on. So this is the dashboard actually. Now of course I've been talking about web programming, that is slices, call them web slices, but actually you can use them in a distributed setting as well. So imagine you have a smart home with smart devices, so smart coffee machine, a smart, yeah, smart cat and a smart cat feeder and a smart fridge. And you want these devices to be able to order stuff, coffee, cat food, human food. But of course, if you have a smart cat, you don't trust these devices. You want to confirm your order every evening uh, because otherwise you end up ordering cat food every day, for example. So on your mobile phone, you want uh, at eight o'clock every evening, for example, you want to confirm your orders, maybe add one, uh, remove orders, and so on. So how could we implement this with these slices? So this is just like a pseudocode. So uh, I can have two slices. So a shopping slice that does actual shopping and it uh, keeps a collection of orders. So it will place the order on your favorite web shop. And then I have the place order slice that will actually put a new order in this um, collection. And so the orders collection, uh, I make it replicated, meaning that every device will have a local copy. It can make changes to it. And then the changes will be propagated to every device and your phone as well. And then of course, in my configuration, um, I now say shopping. I only want to be able to do this on my phone, of course, not on the smart devices. And the placing of the order, so adding an order, must be on the fridge, the cat feeder, coffee machine, and on my phone as well. And then actually, you can have your uh, distributed tool, be writing tool that makes an actual distributed application out of it for you. So I've been talking about how web programming is more than programming just your server and your client with this notion of web slices. So um, now I can also explain why, why it's actually totally not clear. But why I use this image, it's an image with a cracked earth, so a tear split earth. Yeah, my advisor didn't get this, so he said, just really tell this with people. Um, so I will put my slides online, just take a look at the picture. So I've talked about TLS approaches, so the TLS frameworks, the TLS rewriting tools, and the TLS languages, and how well they perform uh, concerning to several criteria for rich internet applications. Then I've introduced our uh, approach, tear splitting for JavaScript, and how we extend this with this notion of these small, movable web slices, and together with these placement strategies, and how this allow you to focus on uh, non-functional concerns, such as offline availability. So you can always contact me about this. Um, there will be like a big book, my PhD uh, dissertation, in like half a year, if you're really interested in this. But you can also test it out online and play around with it. So thank you for your attention. Hello. Oh, this is really loud. Can you turn it down slightly, maybe? Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, so I was, I was seeing when you had the uh, kind of everything in one file. Would, would it be possible to kind of take that file and instead of splitting it up into, you know, client and server, transform it into something where you could kind of run effectively like integrated tests that kind of test the coordination between the client and the server, but without, you know, kind of actually having to have a, a, a web browser and a... Um, 
Wait, so you mean um, just the Node.js client process, for example, or? Yeah, some, something that would kind of like test the, whether the thing that appeared on the browser um, is yeah, interacting at the moment, correctly. We really focus on this browser client and single server instance, but we are working on tools that are aware of the transformation that happens. So you will have a known unit testing framework that we provide, a known debugger, that actually knows like, Something is happening in here with this distributed call, but actually that was that local call from in your original code, so it will map back to your original code. So uh, with these rewriting tools, uh, so this is also a rewriting tool, you have to provide your own uh, transformation-aware tooling. So that's definitely what we are working at. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, so I think you said maybe this is future work, but with replicating data that's supposed to be stored on the server, is it just, like, how is that replication happening to the clients to ensure that, like, it gets there, and is there any kind of ordering guarantees that happen? Uh, yeah, so at the moment, uh, I've written my own library uh, that uses proxies to make sure that on the client side, when you do an update, it gets propagated and so on, and uh, underneath it, it uses our own RPC framework. So this annotation, buffer, retry, it also works on your data replication. Um, of course, if you have like your own uh, library for rep replicated data, you could uh, rewrite the tool such that it gives output for uh, this as well. But at the moment, we have our own small library. Uh, it's lost writer wins at the moment that it implements, but you could extend it, of course. Any other questions? I'll ask one question. Okay. I never get to ask questions. Uh, I have a question about the retries. Okay. So you say retry twice, but how do you know it's safe to retry the operation? Like for instance, if the response was dropped, and so when you retry it, it performs the operation twice and it's not idempotent. Yeah, um, so it's just on the network exception that we retry, so if you get a network exception. And uh, we also take into account side effects, so they only will be executed once, so when it uh, succeeds. So if you retry, it's not like you're going to write twice to a database or so, for example. Uh, so it's only on a network exception. Um, the ordering, yeah, it's just on top of sockets. Uh, so it's just the ordering in which you did them, but uh, we don't give any guarantees there. Yeah. Any final questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>